So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webcast, Careers in Law Librarianship, a roundtable discussion. And uh, it's amazing to see the incredible interest for our program and the field of law librarianship. Um, it was very exciting to see the number of registrations for our event. I know that we have a fair number of um, those interested uh, who will be viewing the recording later. So we're happy to provide that. Uh, everybody who is in attendance will also get a link to the recording once the session or event has concluded and we um, process the recording. So look forward to that in your emails. Um, just as a quick introduction, my name is Vicki Steiner. I'm an instructor here at San Jose State University School of Information. And I'm so honored to host our esteemed panel of speakers today who represent work in different areas of law librarianship and have a wealth of information to share about opportunities and trends in law librarianship hiring, how to be a competitive job applicant, how to conduct a successful job interview, and I'll get over to our agenda here so we can see kind of the general topic areas we'll be talking about today. Also scholarship and mentorship opportunities and strategies for effective networking and much, much more. So I think you're in for a treat today. Now, most people think of academic law libraries and reference when they think of law librarianship. Though there are many more job opportunities available in other types of legal information environments, such as government or public library, law libraries, private law firms, and even corporate organizations. And within those environments, opportunities are available in both brick and mortar and remote settings. And we'll hear about that today as well. So I don't wanna take away from our panelists presenting time because we have a lot to share with you today. So each speaker will be providing their own brief introduction. And the general format today is just what the event suggests, conversational style roundtable discussion where each of our speakers will share their advice and expertise and we'll open it up for questions to everybody in attendance. Uh, we do have a Q and A section um, that you can post your questions throughout, we'll be addressing those at the end. So do enter those in the Q&A and we'll look forward to answering those questions at the end of this presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our amazing speakers. And again, thank you all for joining us today. Hello everyone, my name is Havala. I am a research and knowledge analyst at Ogletree Deacons, which is a global labor and employment firm. Before then I was at San Diego Public Law Library and I graduated from the high school in 2020. Before that I earned my paralegal certificate and I was one of those weird kids growing up who always said they were going to be a judge. So <laughs> I don't know, law librarian judge, we made it. I'm so glad to be here. Good evening, everybody. I'm Diane Ellis, and I'm the lawyer who always wanted to be a librarian. So after practicing law for 30 years, I finally applied and was accepted to and started attending the MLS program at San Jose State University. Um, I graduated uh, last year and joined the law library at the USC Gould School of Law. And now I'm a law librarian, research services, and adjunct assistant professor of law. I teach legal research to first year law students, as well as conducting legal research workshops for some USC undergraduates, and also provide a reference and research services to the Gould faculty and students. And I'm very happy to be here with you all tonight. Hello, my name is Cheryl Kelly Fisher. I'm an academic law librarian. Um, I came to law librarianship the long way. Uh, one of my former careers, I was a practicing attorney um, and then I went to library school. Um, I worked at the UCLA Law Library for about 15 years. I was a reference librarian and 
um, the head of instructional services there before becoming the director of the law library here um, at the Loyola Law School in downtown Los Angeles. Very happy to be here. Hi, I'm Diana Jacques. I'm uh, an associate dean and the John Stafford Law Library director here at the USC Law School. I began my career in this library many years ago as a library assistant, and this was such a supportive culture here that I went to San Jose State and obtained my MLIS, and then later I was encouraged to seek a law degree, which I completed at Loyola Law School. So it's unusual that I first went to library school and then to law school second. Um, my work is also the work I've done and the positions I've had prior to being director is also unusual and that my background is in acquisitions and collection development. I negotiated licensing agreements and negotiated pricing for databases. So that's unusual for a library director. I am really happy to be here as a former grad of this program. And I'm just so proud that we have so many interested people here today. Hi everyone, my name is Sangeeta Pal, and I am the Access Services Librarian at the UCLA School of Law Library. Um, prior to that, I for many, many years worked at, as uh, in various positions as a library assistant and then later as a project manager. Um, I did that for more than 20 years in libraries and most of those years were in the law library. Um, I also had a little bit of a unique route in that I didn't go back for my MLIS degree until almost 15 years after my undergraduate degree. Um, I had been working in law libraries for many years at that point. And so I knew that I wanted to stay in the world of law libraries. So while I was getting my MLIS, I did some exploring on career options in law librarianship because I, unlike many of the others here, do not have my JD. Um, and I think that I am actually too old to go back to law school at this point. So I am happy that I found a career path that worked that doesn't require that. So I'm thrilled to be here. I'm looking forward to talking with you all. All right. Um, hi, everybody. So I am Holly Riccio. I'm the director currently at the California Judicial Center Library, which is the library that serves the California Supreme Court and the California Court of Appeals First Appellate District. Um, now, uh, in, I guess in full disclosure, since we're talking about what we wanted to be as children or whatever, um, I alphabetized my records in high school, and I think that was a sign. And also both my parents were librarians in full disclosure. So uh, I think this was destined for me. Um, and although I'm in the court now, I actually spent my career and kind of grew up in law firms. Um, I started as a reference librarian. Um, I've also held positions where I worked not only reference, but I was also kind of embedded with the marketing team. Um, I've taken on management roles and supervisory roles in firms and even took on a very kind of uh, different role where I was the uh, person that developed and led an inaugural internal leadership development training program for managers and supervisors within the firm um, and also became a liaison to the KM group from the library. Um, and in my last job at a firm, I was actually the director of library and knowledge management. Um, and one of the things I got to do there was revamp and launch a brand new intranet and uh, kind of transition a team from kind of a library uh, point of view to a more KM centric staff. So um, definitely have had kind of a, a breadth of information and, and things that I've done within law firms. Um, I do not have a JD, um, but I have my library degree from many years ago and um, really happy to be here with this group and hopefully add, uh, you know, another point of view to um, the ones that we already have here, which is fantastic. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for those introductions. And so we're just going to dive right into our discussion. I'm going to stop the screen share and um, take it away, everyone. I think I'll kick it off. Um, so the first topic on our agenda um, is uh, to talk a little bit about some opportunities and current trends in law librarianship hiring. Um, and so I can start with this one and speak to trends from hiring um, in the academic law library angle. 
Um, before I dive in, though, I think I should preface um, my comments with a really quick rundown of the typical degree requirements for an academic law librarian, which you know includes the MLIS degree for librarians working in departments like access and collections management and technical services. Um, but then for the reference and research instruction librarian positions specifically, there's often um, an additional degree required, and that of course is you know the law degree, the JD. Um, so the first trend I think is noteworthy is the increase in academic law librarian postings um, between the years of 2021 and 2022. Um, there's about a 55% increase in them, according to some data from the American Association of Law Libraries uh, Career Center job list. And the people who are you know, hypothesizing the reasons for that increase would say things like, um, you know, COVID retirements and hiring freezes and you know, the great resignation um, all made the space for this flood of postings um, that occurred once you know, many institutions emerged from those hiring freezes. Um, and then I think you know, a quick skim of those um, recently posted positions um, show that many of them are entry level uh, or at least open to applicants with just a few years of experience. Um, and if I were to choose a few other noteworthy characteristics of the recent postings um, that are worth mentioning, I'd say um, there's more that focus on digital resources than there were before COVID, although, you know, of course, things were trending towards digital already. Um, and then I think, you know, academia is still more often than not an in-person industry, um, but I'd say the fact that hybrid positions are much more available now than ever before is noteworthy. Um, you know, offering the chance to work remote um, one or more days per week for positions where, you know, there are duties amenable to offsite work. Um, and the second trend I wanted to mention is anecdotal, though it is currently being studied, and that's the notable amount of um, these many new job postings that are remaining unfilled. Um, so one of the most discussed hypotheses for these, um, for this is, you know, the idea that the dual degree requirement for academic law library reference positions, that JD plus the MLIS, um, might be too high a barrier for entry to the profession. And so that's true across the board, sure, but um, significantly true for people of color and marginalized community members. So one of the reasons that a dual degree might be a barrier is student loan debt, of course. Um, and so with an eye towards, you know, increasing diversity in the profession, um, there's a lot of discussion and some action even taking place around the idea of dropping that dual degree requirement from at least some um, academic law librarian positions. So those are some things I think are noteworthy um, trends um, from the academic angle. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I'm gonna speak from the position of being fairly new to the industry. This is now the beginning of my fourth year in law librarianship. And I would definitely say when you read job requirements, and job postings, know that they are suggestions. I was hired as a part-time reference librarian before I had completed my MLIS. I was actually, I had a year left and I started part-time at San Diego Law Library before I had completed my master's degree. And I know that it takes a lot of courage to read a job posting and then immediately say, oh, I don't qualify for this. Here's six different reasons why, but I would challenge you to read the job description and say, okay, Here's one thing that I can definitely bring to the table and then just start building from there. My job search definitely changed. I would say while I was in my MLIS program, I was definitely looking for those keywords of librarian, reference librarian, library assistant. Whereas three years under my belt at the public law library, I started to see more words like analyst. Knowledge management is huge at the firm level. So then I would change your keyword searching for those job postings. I would definitely check out job boards like the AAA website, of course, but then also your local chapters like the SCAL, Southern California Association of Law Libraries, SCAL, as well as when you're thinking about your skills when it comes to the table. Yes, I know your students, but a lot of you come from very diverse backgrounds, and that's a huge leg up. And you should learn how to read a job description and transfer experiences that may be a little bit different. For a big example of this is customer service. That's pretty ubiquitous across all librarianship roles. Mine is 100% remote, 
but I'm still interacting with uh, practicing attorneys, paralegals, legal professionals all day long. And so customer service, that can come from anything. That can come from custodial, that can come from fast food work, that can come from working in retail. And so I would say, even if you are just beginning your program, start your job search now, because I was able to ride out the pandemic with a full-time position at San Diego Law Library, which is a huge blessing right in the midst of a lot of different layoffs. And I'm very grateful for that. And I think that from semester one, the program really prepares you to start the start that journey running. So those are my little tidbits. And I would say I found great success without a JD. I of course want one. I don't know if it's just a feather in my cap or the fact that going to law school, Bill Woods made it look so fun. I know it's not that fun, but I would say a paralegal certificate really equipped me with those legal research skills. Vicky's class, if you haven't taken it yet, shameless plug, take her legal research class. It was excellent. And definitely read through your resume with a judicious eye. Say, okay, here's what I do have. Here's what I do bring to the table. And lastly, just to hit on knowledge management, again, is a huge trend in firm librarianship. And that's where, that's where you're going to see those analyst positions. I see, Diane, you took your uh, mic off. Do you have something to share? I'm, when you're when you're when you've completed yours, you're doing a fabulous job that I'm just ready to, to segue into the next section. Oh, Holly, did you have anything then before we segue to the next topic? Um, I, I mean, I guess the only thing I can add from the government side is that um, sometimes positions, you know, it takes a long time to change titles or titles could be very like generic, right? It'll just say law librarian, you know, but you're essentially the director, right? I mean, so I guess I would just, you know, just say you've got to read through, you know, for a government position, you've got to, got to look at it for a court or something like that and just look at what's actually in the job description. And, you know, the title may not necessarily match, um, but you can definitely get, again, like everybody said, you know, read the description and see what kind of fits with your skills and, um, you know, and go ahead and take take a chance. All right, then I'm going to uh, jump in here and I'm going to do a quick share screen that hopefully will come up. Uh, can everyone see that I've got some uh, Prezi slides up here? I see the okay. flower. All right, you see my pretty flower here. Okay, everybody. So first up, I want to do a special shout out to anybody who's gone back to school after being out of school for a while or is looking to make a career change, because I just want to tell you that it's not too late. And if you're thinking about doing it, jump in there, apply to law school, apply to library school, and be prepared to make um, a change that maybe you've wanted to make for a very long time. So as I said, I was a practicing attorney for a very long time. So a year ago, I was an MLS, MLIS student at San Jose State University, and I was a practicing attorney. I graduated in May. I interviewed in July. And in August, I started here at the uh, USC Gould School of Law. Two weeks after coming to work at USC, I was teaching two legal research classes to first-year law students. I had no experience working in any library and I had no experience teaching, but luckily I was supported by a great group of librarians and a great library staff. So looking back at how I got here and what helped me get this position, I wanted to talk about a few different things that can help you, I think, stand out as a job candidate when you're looking for a job in law librarianship. So we're gonna briefly talk about which classes will be helpful, what kind of experiences will help you get hired and which skills will help you succeed. So first of all, let's look at classes. So first and foremost is legal resources and legal research. And I wanna second what Hodlis said about taking Professor Steiner's class at San Jose State University. If you want to work in any kind of law librarianship, you've got to be able to do um, legal research. And this is particularly true if you don't have a JD. So a good class at library school is going to be invaluable to you. And even though I'd been a practicing attorney for 30 years at the time I took this class, 
it helped me rethink my approach to legal research and sort of doing it from the ground up instead of just jumping in as I would as an attorney who'd been doing that. And that experience in the legal research class has really helped me. It's been invaluable when I've been teaching legal research myself. Um, other types of helpful classes are those that are technology oriented. When I was in law school, I typed my papers on an IBM electric selectric typewriter. And particularly for older students, a lack of familiarity with current technology can be a very real barrier to success in school. So I took technology tools, I learned how to do basic coding, and I learned how to create a basic website. It was a great learning experience for me. And after that, I was so proud of my little, frankly, lame website that I'd created, that whenever I took a new class at San Jose State and you did an introductory post, I would link to my website so they could see pictures of my pets and learn all about me. But it was a great experience and got me a lot more comfortable with current technology. Um, also, it, it, classes that are service and teaching oriented are very helpful. And in particularly one class at San Jose State that's available is peer mentoring. Um, San Jose State students have the opportunity to act as peer mentors for the new MLS students. I highly recommend applying to serve as a peer mentor if the opportunity arises for you. It gave me the opportunity to work with educational technology tools like Canvas, but working on them from the instructor's side. Um, it taught me to teach using webinars and videos, to become familiar with learning theories, to grade students' work, and to address the needs and questions of MLS students. Um, other helpful classes address issues facing libraries and learning the basics of cataloging. And also going back for a moment up to the top, um, other helpful classes are government information sources and internet searching. Um, Any more, so much information is digitized now that you need to be able to find information on the web, whether it's at a government source or an other source that's available online. So another issue that may come up is what is your experience? What kind of experience will be helpful? So when I was looking for a job in law librarianship, um, a barrier I faced was that I didn't have any experience working in a law library or an academic library. And many libraries, when I was looking at their job postings, and Havila was spot on with this, don't just don't just look at a job posting and think I can't, I don't qualify for this, or this doesn't apply to me. Um, many libraries wanted someone with one to three years of library experience, which I obviously didn't have, but some were willing to consider my practicing law as an alternative to experience in a law library. Now, on reflection, um, while I was at San Jose State, I was working full time and then COVID hit and everything was shut down. But if there's one thing I could, would go back and do differently, I would certainly try to get uh, an internship position in a library or get a job working in a library. But my point is, don't be afraid to apply for jobs where you might not exactly fit the job description. So even though I lacked library experience, working as a lawyer for so long gives me a unique viewpoint in teaching legal research, and that's a plus. So figure out what unique things you bring to the table. Um, other ways to get good experience, uh, like I said, practicing law, volunteering at a library, or again, acting as a peer mentor. So another issue I wanna briefly address is what skills will be helpful for you in law librarianship. And obviously this is particularly um, in an academic law library. Um, first and foremost, legal research skills. This includes being able to uh, work with Lexis and Westlaw, with Nexus Uni, which is more of an undergraduate version of Lexis, uh, Bloomberg, Google Scholar. There's lots of online sources where you need to be able to use your legal research skills and find information. Service skills are helpful. Um, teaching and reference skills. Um, I found I really enjoy teaching and I'm still learning and working to be a better teacher. And again, technical skills, uh, like learning to prepare LibGuides. I did a couple of LibGuides while I was at San Jose State. I'm working on a couple now at USC. 
learning to prepare instructional videos. Uh, and this came up in a lot of classes, learning to do slide presentations, whether PowerPoint or Google Slides, or in this case, I'm using Prezi. But in conclusion, I wanna just say, don't be afraid to leave your comfort zone. Librarians provide a helpful and supportive environment. And I just wanted to let you know too, to please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about either being a lawyer and going back to school to get your library degree, about uh, what it's like to work as a law librarian after having another career for a very long time. Um, I'm more than happy to, uh, to speak with any of you. So please feel free to contact me. Thanks, Diane. So I think I'm up next. And um, when I started thinking about how to be a competitive applicant, a lot of different things came to mind. And one thing that I noticed just in the, in the little bit of time that we've been in this roundtable so far is you're going to find that many of us are saying very similar things, possibly coming from it um, from slightly different directions. Um, but at first, I was thinking about adjusting what I was going to say. And then I thought, perhaps we do need to repeat ourselves a little bit just so that we can help drive home the point. So my number one piece of advice for when you are um, applying for jobs and trying to be a competitive applicant is really to market yourself. So Havla mentioned this, Diane mentioned this, but seriously, I cannot tell you how important it is for you to spend some time reading the job description, spend some time reading the required skills, and then think about how your skills and experiences can relate to that or contribute to it or maybe you don't have the direct experiences that the job description is calling for, but what are transferable skills that you can bring to the position? Because the reality is these are all human resource issues and we are all people and we all come to the table with our own backgrounds and skills and experiences and journeys and paths to how we came to the profession. And you are among those same candidates. And so bring yourself, bring your best self and think about how you would be the best person um, to fill a particular role and how your unique experiences and skills can help fill that role. So I cannot say it enough, market yourself and really think about what you're bringing to the table as you're looking at varying job postings. Um, so in addition to all the great information and Diane um, did a really thorough presentation of a lot of things, I was trying to focus on just a few tips that I learned when I was in my MLIS program. So I went to UCLA's program and so that was largely in person and had some different things available there. So I don't know if everything will be transferable, um, but I'm hoping that some of these tips will be. Uh, the first is as it relates to courses. So Diane listed some really fantastic courses that will help you um, as you're pursuing a career in law librarianship. The other thing that I'd encourage you towards is taking a varied course load and thinking about classes that you are passionate about or areas that you find very, very interesting. So when I was in library school, I had been in the law school for a long time and our head of technical services strongly encouraged me to take both descriptive and subject cataloging. Now I knew that I was probably never gonna be a cataloging librarian and that's true for me and my career path, but I cannot tell you how invaluable it has been to me time and time again that I got exposure to that level of detail when I took those classes. And it really helped springboard me into some additional opportunities um, and professional development things that I've been able to participate in. One small example is that um, we recently switch to an entirely new integrated library system here at UCLA. And I chaired that endeavor here on our campus for all 13 of our libraries. And I think having some of that background and experience in cataloging and acquisitions through some of those classes really helped me to have a more robust view of how different aspects fit together in an ILS. Um, the other example I have is relating to preservation and archives. So again, I thought I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So while I was in library school, I never took any classes in preservation or archives. And that's a huge 
part of a specialization at UCLA, but I just elected not to take any of those classes. And to be perfectly honest, I'm a little bit regretting that now because in my current position, I've sort of um, inherited the law school archive that's administered by the library. And now I'm backpedaling and trying to figure out all the other ways that I can learn about archives and preservation. Thankfully, I'm on a big campus and can, can take advantage of some of the other librarians here. But I just say all that to say, if you love archives or if you're really interested in oral histories or if there's some other class that you think would be really fascinating, take the class. Um, it will just help make your um, portfolio more robust, and it may bring some interesting things to the table to make you a more competitive candidate. Um, so the two last things I'm going to share on this topic, one is about internship and work experience. You've heard about this, but I have to say any kind of hands-on work, project, um, anything that you're doing kind of in a real world experience that can come alongside what you're learning in your classes is going to make you a more competitive applicant. Um, and then the last thing is about professional organizations and opportunities that you have as a student. While you're a student, there's a lot that you have available to you and available to you at a more affordable price than when you're not a student. So to the degree possible, I strongly encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities um, and even just reaching out to folks and networking. Librarianship is a very generous profession. And I was really privileged to work in an environment with a lot of librarians. And when I was pursuing my MLIS degree, and even while I was in the program, I can't tell you how many times I went knocking on my colleagues' doors to ask questions, to get guidance, to get advice. And there's so much that librarians are happy, happy to share with you. If you say, hey, I'm a student and I want to learn more about this or I want to hear about this. So I echo Diane's closing statement, which is, if any of you ever want some guidance or discussion or have follow-up questions, you're always uh, welcome to contact me directly um, after this program is over. Thank you. That was amazing, Sangeeta. Um, and Diane, I have a couple like smaller points that I just wanna add to the mix um, on the topic of being a competitive applicant. Um, I would say that, you know, Along the same lines as has been said before, you know, if um, if you you know the any of the advice that you know you just heard isn't in the cards for you, maybe it's you know too late to take Professor Steiner's legal resources class. Um, then find the transferable skills in what you have done or what you you know have the ability to take. So maybe you took a class on you know, library programming and services for children, you know, find the transferable skills in there. So in academic law libraries, we need people skilled at planning, you know, and creating programming. Um, you know, internships, did you intern virtually at, you know, you know, a digital library working on digital collection management? I, you know, then you've not only gained direct experience with digital collections, law libraries have those, um, but you also have experience with professional remote work. And even though I think I said before that, um, many corners of academia are still very focused on the in-person student experience. Um, hybrid work is often available and, you know, being a professional in a remote environment is, you know, a highly valued skill. Um, the other small thing I wanted to add to the discussion is another, um, another way to look at uh, involvement with professional organizations. So we've thrown out the word AALL a lot, the, um, um, the American Association of, of Law Libraries. Um, so, you know, for instance, AALL um, has um, a website that's a wealth of information um, that you can use to learn more about the profession. So in addition to everything said above about you know, professional organizations, um, you know, we perform our jobs at our place of employment, but outside of that, we work together in the professional organizations um, to do things like contribute to the betterment of the profession, you know? So um, we talk about things, we work on things like how to improve our services, how to increase diversity in our ranks, um, how to promote social justice. And the websites of these organizations are full of information about all of that work. So it, that could be a source of inspiration for maybe a paper topic in your classes. It could maybe help you start thinking about how you would contribute to this work and, and think about what librarians, um, law librarians are working on that excites you um, 
And then you can talk about that, you know, in your cover letter to be a competitive applicant. Um, it can show a potential employer that you're interested in engaging um, with and in serving the profession at large. So those are my little tips. Well, thank you, Cheryl, for your very large, important tips. They're by no means little. Those are very important guys. I hope you were taking notes. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to speak to this from the perspective of being an extreme extrovert. I know in a remote, remote job, how is that happening? But I understand that not all of you are that way. And taking the step out to see someone in an IRL is really scary. So I acknowledge and I honor that. That, that said, I enrolled in the remote program, taking advantage of every single in-person opportunity that was available to me. I had the freedom of being able to take part-time positions that were open in the program. I planned my own local meetups when there were meetups that were super far away from me. I reached out to the administration and said, hey, are there people in like San Diego area that maybe want to hang? And we met up and we had pie a couple of times. And I will say, those are the people that I still keep in contact with after my program. Those are the people I reach out to for references when I don't have enough professional to fill out the whole thing. And also, it was important to me to reach out to people in the particular niche I decided I wanted to work in, because those are the people that opened the doors for me to eventually get that job at San Diego Law Library. I remember her name is Erin Grimes. I spoke to her on the phone. She was already working there at the time. And I asked her if I could list her as a reference. She said yes. And then I got the job. And that, you know, people think that networking can be nefarious and creepy. And it, it's honestly not, especially because what Sangeeta said, that law librarianship is a very generous profession. I think we've all come from different backgrounds where there are people that are not quite as generous, depending on who you're speaking to. And I went to a bunch of informational interviews at different law school libraries. Um, GIA, the Gemological Institute of America is local to me. They have a really rad library. And everyone I spoke to just was overflowing with information and wanted to share and they wanted to help me. So if you're nervous, I'm going to tell you it's okay. But pretty much any person I've met in this profession has been willing to go the extra mile to help me. So that's that's that. Uh, student assistantships was huge. I got to work as a research assistant, write for the iStudent blog, and I ended my career at the at the iSchool working as a content editor at the Student Research Journal. Now, these are not things that necessarily relate directly to law librarianship, but they were very important in that that was professional experience in a master's level program that I could point to in my interviews and when I was writing my cover letters. Internships, yes, 100%. Also want to do a shout out to archives. I did an internship at the San Diego, oh, they changed their name, San Diego Global Zoo Global Library and Archives. So you know where the Safari Park is? There's a library behind that. And I got to work there for a semester. And again, not directly transferable to law librarianship, but was transferable because it was a library. And it was what professional experience in a library. And I will tell you, people were very excited when they saw that on my resume. They just want to talk all about the zoo. So if you're passionate about a particular organization and they have an opportunity for you to go volunteer or do an internship, chase that, do that. And the women that work there still mentor me to this day. So very important. Faculty mentors, hello. Yes, Vicki Steiner is a huge resource for you. She will be there for you. She will stand in the gap. Vicki is the reason that I am in law librarianship and I am so grateful to her. I came to her and I'd pretty much given up guys. I was like, I worked in like four different law firms and it was, it was not a party. It's not anything like I expected. And I had pretty much come to get my master's degree because I was expected to be in a completely different industry. And Vicki was like, I hear you, Havala. I hear you, but this is what you should do this. And I was like, no, she's like, okay okay, just take my class quietly. And then I came to her and I said, okay, I think I want to do this. <laughs> and here we are four years later. So Vicki, thank you. Reach out to Vicki. She's a huge resource for that. Then we already talked about this, peer mentors. That was a huge opportunity for me because I got to teach at a master's level for adult education in my master's program. So transferable skills, all that. And that, those are all the tips I have for being a competitive applicant. Do we have anything else before we move on to the next topic? 
You're way too kind, Alpha. That's <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> I don't disagree. All right, next topic. Yes. Um, I think the next topic is conducting a successful job interview. Um, I'll start, but because I happen to know that my fellow panelists are going to give you lots of amazing advice, I'm going to limit my comments here to just one aspect of the job interview, and that's the presentation. Um, you know, you get up in front of the group and you present on a topic during your interview, and it may not be a part of every one's interview, but um, for an academic librarian position, you may be told that you have to do a presentation. Um, teaching positions especially will often require you to give a teaching demonstration during your interview. You know, pretend that the librarians gather there are students and teach them something. Um, but some non-teaching positions also require a presentation um, addressing a prompt and your thoughts, you know, on an aspect of the job, for instance. So the search committee might pick the topic for you and they'll be looking at your interpretation of the topic, at your insight, um, any innovative approach you might take to it, um, or you might be asked to choose the topic yourself and you can either take a subject that's familiar to you, of course, um, or you might consider doing some research like on you know, the mission of the institution where you're interviewing and make sure that you're tailoring that topic um, to one that matches the focus of the institution versus one that has you know, nothing to do with the place that you're interviewing. Um, but I think to wrap up my thoughts on that, the, Perhaps the most important thing you can show via your presentation, if you're asked to do one, is how prepared you can be when you have time to put your best foot forward. So that's the bottom line, I think. Make make good choices in preparation and um, and 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 approach your your presentation um, with with seriousness. <laughs> All right. Um, how are you? Are you up next? It's me again, guys. I'll be quick. I promise. Interviews, terrifying. Okay, let's we'll acknowledge that. That can be very intimidating. So what do we do? We prepare. We come up with practice questions. We practice with our dog. We practice with our mom. We practice with our best friend. And let them ask you random questions. It's okay. It'll get you out of this like mindset. And I would say also, you always come with a list of questions specific to what Cheryl was talking about, the mission of the institution, uh, the company culture pretty much things that you would actually want to know about the company that you would perhaps go work for. And that also impresses the interviewer because it shows that you are prepared. So practice, bring questions to ask your interviewer specific to their background, specific to the company. Uh, bring extra copies of your resume, print it out. There's a thing called paper. I don't know if anyone uses it anymore, but take it with you, hand it to everyone you speak to. So here's, here's my resume, guys. Or if you don't want to be that aggressive, you don't have to, but just bring it with you to be prepared. And lastly, going back to the paper thing, write a handwritten thank you note and mail it to that person. No one ever does this anymore. And they'll just be like, wow. you don't have to bake them cookies because that would be too aggressive. But handwritten thank you note, or if it was a virtual interview, same concept, do it via email. Those are my tidbits, guys. I think Sangeeta. Yep. Um, so Cheryl and Havilas, gave you a lot of really fantastic advice. So I just was trying to think of a couple of other suggestions and things that I would urge you to consider. Um, the first is, I think practice questions is an excellent idea because the better you get at articulating your skills and where you've come from and what you've done and things like that, the better. The other thing I'd urge you to consider are very specific and varied examples that demonstrate those skills. Right. So you can say I'm really analytical or I'm a fantastic researcher or whatever. But then if you have an actual project and here's how I used those skills and this is what I did with it. And if you can showcase or demonstrate how you can use those skills, that gives you a competitive edge in the interview. So it's not just words coming out of your mouth, but you actually have something to show for it. It doesn't have to be in the workplace. If it is, that's great. If it's in an internship or volunteer experience, that's great. But it could also be a project that you did. For a class, I am mentoring an MLIS student at UCLA right now, and one of her class assignments is to build a virtual escape room game and, you know, different things like that. Like, 
that stuff that she's working on, that is actual tangible work product that could be used as an example to demonstrate your skill. So just be thinking about those things and think about a variety of them as you're preparing for your interview. The second thing I urge you to think about is why are you applying for this job? Whenever we're interviewing candidates, I always ask that question and it's always very telling if someone didn't think about that answer, right? You are a valuable resource that's coming to a job interview. You bring something to the table, but then that place and that position should also be working to your benefit for your career goals and your professional aspirations. So think about why you want to do this. How does this fit into to your career? What inspired you to apply for this job? And if you don't know, think about that before you get into the interview, because someone's going to ask you that question. Um, is, and this is just a repeat, but again, research where you're applying, figure out who works there, what's the organal, organizational structure, who reports to whom, um, how does the library fit within the larger institution? So at my library, for example, the law library fits within the law school, but the law library and the law school also fits in within a larger campus of UCLA, also fits in within a larger institution, which is the entire UC. That's not always gonna be the place, but if you're in a firm library, how many locations does that firm have? Who all do they serve? What kind of users are you going to have? All of these, this type of research is going to show your engagement with the job. And that comes across in an interview. You all of a sudden are not just an applicant on a piece of paper, but you're a human that's coming to the table and cares and wants this job. And those factors make a difference. The last thing that I'm going to say is going to sound cliche again. I say it to everyone who interviews, and it's really true. When you are going to an interview, make sure you're coming with it questions, not just about the place and not just about the job, but about the environment and the workplace, because as much as they are interviewing you, you ought to be interviewing them. Jobs will come and go, opportunities will come and go, but having colleagues and an environment and a culture where you will thrive professionally is invaluable and no price can be put on that. So go into your interviews thinking about that. Is this a place where I fit in? Is this a place where my personality is going to thrive? Is this going to be a place where I can professionally grow and will be a stepping stone in my career um, or a place where I might go and retire? Um, in any of those instances, always be thinking about how that place fits with you. Because again, that's going to come across in inter your interview process as you're serious about this place, you're serious about this job, and you're thinking about what's going to be the best fit for them and you. Okay, that's all. Anything else before we move to scholarships? I can throw one thing in really quickly, which is just to make sure that you understand what the interview is gonna be like. You, know, you may go somewhere where you're gonna meet with three or four different people that'll come into the room separately and talk to you, or you could be, you know, and, and it'll go over a couple of hours, or you could be, you know, in front of, you know, six people at once for half an hour, right? So you really have to understand that and that may help you tailor what you are gonna do or aren't gonna do or what you're gonna say and how you say it and your timing. So um, that's just something to make sure you understand before you get in the door there too. Absolutely. So one last thing just on that topic. If you are presented with an agenda of what your interview schedule is going to look like, figure out who the people are that you're meeting. Websites have directories. Figure out what they do and understand who you're talking to. And that will also be really helpful in tailoring your answers to different groups. Definitely. Thank you, Sangeeta. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you guys about scholarships because as we know, master's degrees are expensive. So truth universally acknowledged, it's very expensive. So I have applied when I was a student, I applied to the SGSU iSchool scholarship opportunities. Um, I think I did a Prezi presentation for one of them. I was not successful in that, but I knew a lot of people that were. So that's, that's a no-brainer opportunity for you. That's a scholarship money that your school is offering. If you can take a couple of hours to put together a deliverable for that, it's definitely worth your time and it hones your skills and is a work product, school product you can point to 
on your resume if the topic fits what you're applying for. American Association of Law Libraries local chapters also has scholarship opportunities. I applied for SCAL's scholarship opportunity when I was a student in 2018 and I was successful. And I know other people that were successful too. And the evaluatory information is really just talking about what you're passionate about, what you're hopeful to achieve in your program and looking at your academic standing. So again, take a few hours, write out that application. And the deadline for SCALS scholarship is coming up on Monday, March 27th. Thank you to the kind librarian who put these notes in for me. I really, really appreciate you. And we can also, I think Vicki is sending out a list of links after. So that link will be in there, but it's S-C-A-L-L, -L, Southern California Association of Law Libraries. That is coming up. And then, so you must live in Southern California or be enrolled in a graduate student and one of the programs. And I think that NoCal also has a similar program as well. So that's SCAL, but then NoCal, so N-O-C-A-L-L. -L. So if you're into law librarianship and you wanna apply for a scholarship, stuff at SJSU iSchool, definitely. And then scholarship opportunities uh, as part of the local chapters. And I think people have asked me, oh, I don't wanna apply for that because I'm not a member. I was not a member of SCAL when I was awarded the scholarship opportunity. They understand that you're a student and that you don't have time to be active in their chapter, but what they're hoping to do is create that pipeline of law librarianship professionals and further your education, further your professional career, and that's what those scholarships are for. Anything else on scholarships? And I will just add that at the end there, I will be um, providing a link to all of the resources that we've been discussing today. So once I send out the recording link for today's session, there'll be also a link to the um, all of the handouts and information about scholarship opportunities and so forth. And I do also want to encourage everybody also to make good use of our Q&A um, room. And so we'll, we're queuing up questions for the end. So if you have questions, don't uh, be shy about posting those and we'll get to them at the end. So I'm at, up next um, dealing with strategies for effective networking. And I first want to add that Havala is totally correct about applying for these scholarships. During my time, I, as a student at SJSU, I received a $1,500 scholarship from SCAL and a $3,500 scholarship from AAAL, and that paid for the majority of my degree at San Jose State. So strategies for effective networking. So first off, you need to understand that at points in my life until I really started blossoming in my career, I was painfully shy and still an introvert. So it's kind of an odd topic for me to be speaking about networking, but I've actually come to very much enjoy it in my career and enjoy the people I've met along the way. And uh, we share resources with one another. So you know, first I'll talk about online conferences and meetings and just quite simply ask questions. Um, this helps people to know you and to know your interests. And people are more interested in you than you would think. Many people have jobs that are open and we're looking to find someone to fill that job. So we're paying attention to new and interesting students who appear in these uh, different meetings and conferences. So also be active in breakout rooms, get to know the other participants if there are opportunities. One thing I've taken to do at work to network myself across campus is to follow up and send an email after the meeting to someone who'd said something really interesting to me, um, to the group rather. One other thing just to underscore for the 50th time today, librarians are helpers, they are nurturers. If you reach out to any librarian by email, chances are you'll get an email back back and they'll be willing to meet with you so just or to, to speak with you by phone about their career and what they do so just make sure that you um you are just aware that that's not an unusual request or ask i receive several requests a year and i'm always happy to speak with people if you can attend an in-person conference and i'll put a plug in for the scal institute on the bottom uh bottom right corner we're having an institute next week sixty dollars for students 
if you can attend. But in-person conferences are great. Conversations are very easy at, conf- at in-person conferences. You already have something to talk about. You have things in common by just sitting in that room together and staying at the same hotel and hearing these sessions. You know, there are many, many people to speak to at these conferences. You can also volunteer to staff things like the registration desk at a conference. Think about that. You know, I'm sitting there registering people. I'm learning people's names. I'm having making small talk about what institutions where they work at. And I'm finding out things about them and they're finding out things about me. So that's always an easy ask. And you can do that at AAL. And you can also you also used to be able to do that at SCAL. Sit if you're in person, sit down next to someone you don't know. Um, and introduce yourself. As I said, most librarians want to meet students and they may even have a job opening. And I'll just say this to you. One time at a conference, I was asked by someone to put a a placement book out. And I said to them, well, would you mind if I just announced, you know, I was a conference chair, if, if I just announced to someone that you're a job seeker at this conference and they said, sure thing. And I can tell you by the end of that conference, two days later, they had a job from someone in the audience. So this is just really powerful, um, a network that we can all share with one another and help one another um, get jobs. So um, as far as social media goes, LinkedIn is probably well set up for networking for you. Indeed can also be helpful um, in your job search. And I'll also say to you, you're already creating your professional networks right here at SJSU. And if you're in Vicki Steiner's class, I, I won't even tell you how long ago it was, But I took the equivalent class sitting in a room at Cal State Fullerton in in in-person classes in five of those people in that room and ended up being professional law librarians who are still in the law library community and are still people I can ask for favors and questions on a day-to-day basis. So realize you've already started uh, building your network. And I cannot... um, I cannot encourage you more to get involved. Volunteer to work on a committee, AALL, SIS, or a chapter. I think that Sangeeta and I met one another working on SCAL's high school internship committee maybe five or six years ago. And I really treasure my friendship with Sangeeta and we try to help one another as best as we can um, with work things. Holly, did you have anything to add here? Sure, I will be somewhat quick. I know we have other things to get through, but... um course, I will, you know, reiterate what everyone said about um, AAAL as a former AAAL president. It's uh, not necessarily my duty, but it's my love of AAAL to say to, you know, please try to get involved. And it's one of the best things I ever did joining committees and starting to get to meet people. Um, The other thing I will also put in the chat, um, the link to the NoCal Spring Institute, which is coming up in March. Um, There is also a student rate. I don't know that I don't have the amount off the top of my head. And um, NoCal also allows for students to apply for grants to attend things. So, um, you know, be aware of that or contact someone. That's a great opportunity as well. Um, The other thing I would also add is um, expand outside of law librarianship, um, especially on the law firm side. Um, ILTA, which is the International Legal Technology Association, um, their membership is different. It's not by person, it's by organization. So if you are working in a firm, for example, as a reference, even as you know, reference librarian or whatever your title is, if your firm is a member of ILTA, you can be a member and then you can access their educational opportunities and materials and information. And um, there's quite a wealth of things there and could be really helpful. So, um, you know, kind of think outside the box a little bit there too sometimes. And then I would just reiterate, you know, kind of the informational interview or the you know, cold call or cold email to a, to a, a librarian. You know, I've, I've, I've gotten those same kind of calls and I think everybody really enjoys that and it's a great community. So never, um, you know, never feel, you know, intimidated or worried about doing something like that. I think everybody always wants to help and share. Okay, so next we're going to move on to continuing education and mentoring opportunities. So I'll just tell you right now, continuing education, it's abundant. There's so much online content in addition to the restarting of things in person. You just need to know where to look. Um, And so I'm going to take you through some organizations uh, and how your memberships can benefit you there. So AAAL has a student membership, $70. Uh, They offer so many free or low-cost continuing education opportunities such as coffee chats, 
webinars. They also have a library of annual meeting programs. We meet once a year in person, so they have several years worth of recorded programs on many, many um, professional development topics that you can access for free with your membership. Um, they also have a new self-paced legal research course that just opened up recently. I think it's 49, it would be $49 for students with AAAL membership. AAAL special interest sections. So those are grouped by library types. Like I am a member of the Academic Law Libraries SIS. There's also a Government Law Libraries SIS and a Private Law Librarians SIS. Those memberships uh, for library types and also for special interests. Like if you were interested in legal history and rare books, there's a group for that. So those all cost $20 a year. They offer spe more specialized uh, free and low cost webinars and virtual roundtables. One thing I do wish to kind of call out to you is, you know, I'm an academic law librarian, but I go to the Pro private law librarian summit because I think they're sometimes a year or two ahead of the, of the academics. And I always learn something. And that's typically held the um, Saturday before AALL. AALL has also has these things called chapters. We've been we've been given a lot of acronyms in SCAL, Southern California Association of Law Libraries. They have these geographic chapters, and it's six dollars to join SCAL. Um, and so just be aware of that. The West, we haven't talked about Westpac, Western Pacific chapter of AALL. I was just on a call earlier today. They will have their annual meeting in September or October in San Diego this year. So something else to watch for, um, for an in-person opportunity. SLA and ALA also have um, continuing education programs. Other places to find continuing education on discussed on listservs, you might want to remain on your information science schools um, listserv as well. County law libraries have programs for practicing attorneys and they're typically free and you can join as well. Also, sometimes you can see things from the Library of Congress, um, Law Library of Congress as well. Interesting uh, places, but there's just a bountiful feast of so many different uh, continuing education opportunities. Holly, did you have something to add here? No? I, I think you have covered it. I'm okay, I tried. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying Great. to go, I'm trying to okay. just whack these things out. <laughs> um, the last topic I want to talk to is near and dear to my heart, and it's about mentorship. And literally, the job I'm in is not a job I imagined for myself. It is a job that um, was pointed out to me at, by my mentor as something that I might be meant for. And so I've had numerous mentors over the course of my career, five or six of them some long-term, some short, but I've gained a lot from them. And so what are some of the types of things that they have shared with me? Um, career planning advice, particularly when you're thinking of moving up into administration or switching you know, into um, other types of careers or switching institutions, mentors can be extremely helpful. They can also point out to professional development opportunities. One of the people I mentor, I pointed out about the SCAL Institute and said, hey, you can get a grant. And the person was successful with that. Uh, you're going to have mentors, not just at the early stage of your career, but also at uh, critical junctures and mid-career as well. Someone can help you reassess what opportunities might be there for you. Um, my mentor helped me acquire certain skills that I wanted and that were necessary to progress, such as budgeting. This person sat down with me, taught me how to budget maybe 15 years ago. It's just been invaluable. Mentors can be good sources for suggestions, advice, information. And, you know, at one point I thought I might move and my mentor set me up with someone in their network in another city to speak to about jobs and relocating there. So just know that that's, that's, those are the types of information you can get from your mentors. Oftentimes, I think of my mentors as being absolute cheerleaders for me personally. Uh, it's a generally positive thing. I never thought really much about mentoring until mentoring and my mentors found me. But I think teachers, coach, advisors, guide, and and this and friend um, are accurate descriptions of mentors. And as I said, mentors can be help you just at critical moments in your career when you're deciding to deciding to move on to another position. Um, Stay, stay or go, they can just be really awesome. There are also great job references too, and I'll just say that to you. Characteristics of good mentors. Mentors, in my opinion, you know, I really want somebody who gives me very, very good advice. Sound and directed advice. Um, 
you know, they're also selfless many times. They've reached a point in their career where they're willing to extend their hand out to help others. And that can be very useful for you as a mentee. Um, and they're self-confident. You, they, they've achieved what they wanted to, and they're just kind of feeling like they want to pay it forward. Finding a mentor. So in terms of finding mentors, Uh, there are formal and informal pathways to finding mentors. Um, within the National Association, AALL, they have a mentoring program where you can be assigned to someone. I've, I've gone through that. I've been both a mentee and a mentor in that. It's just a very valuable experience. Also, AALL has a leadership academy, and they assign mid-career mentors to people. I found that to be extremely helpful. I had a mentor, for example, when I was in law school, and that person was a sitting experienced library director who helped talk to me about next stages in my career. Chapters also have mentoring opportunities as well. Um, and also SLA has uh, mentoring opportunities. Informal mentoring opportunities, um, you just kind of have to be aware of them. At USC, there's a group of uh, people who do coaching and they will offer you five career coaching um, sessions for free. I'm part of a group at USC called Women in Management. There's a career development group that meets once a month and people discuss, um, discuss moving along with their careers. I think we've had people talk about informational interviews several times, as I mentioned, that's just really great. I'm not gonna turn down someone who wants to speak with me and answer their questions. Um, and lastly, you wanna reach out to people via LinkedIn and social media. You can find mentors that way. You also find mentors through volunteering, You know, uh, particularly for the National Association. That's how I've met a lot of um, people who ended up being my mentors. And just in closing, before I hand off to Holly for her comments, I just want to say you probably have several mentors during your career. I've probably, if I, I sat down to try and think about it today, I probably had about 10 mentors, some of them for just a couple years. But sometimes, you know, even if you haven't talked to someone in five or 10 years, they're so willing to help you still. And that's just typical for our, for our profession. Um, Reach out, to, I would encourage you to reach out to someone who you admire and to see if they're willing to offer you guidance. That can be really important to you. And I've said, as I've said, and others have said, librarians are nurturers and helpers and really just don't even hesitate or think about it before you reach out to someone and to seek their their advice. Holly? Great, thank you. That's a I, I don't have too much to add. The only things I would sort of um, expand on is, I don't know where I got this from, but many years ago, I kind of grabbed onto this concept of having a professional board of directors. So essentially, you know, you kind of curate this throughout your career, um, again, of these kind of mentors or people that you can turn to and making sure that it's, you know, it can be very diverse. I mean, you may start out focusing on law librarians or people that are helping you at, at the early part of your career. Later on, you might find someone who really isn't even a law librarian, but is really good at management or administration or public speaking or things like that. And so you kind of, you know, kind of group, get these people as you go through your career and, and have them to turn to. Um, and so I, that's sort of a concept that I've, I've really grasped and, and used throughout my career. Um, the other thing is, I mean, um, you know, I have gotten more out of mentees that I've had, you know, the, in those relationships, it goes both ways, right? You know, I went to library school a long time ago. I'm old. Um, so I learn a lot from people. And so it's um, it's a great opportunity. So, you know, both both parties usually get a lot out of it if it's kind of a good match and you and you get along. But um, that's all I would add there. So I want to keep it short because I know where we have may have questions and I want to make sure there's time for everything else everybody wants to talk about. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. And I, we do have some questions queued up. I did also open the um, chat. So if uh, you can feel free to type your questions in the chat window or in the Q&A section. So I'm going to go through these. And um, if our speakers would like to tackle the questions, um, feel free to jump in. So the first one we have here is, why don't most academic law libraries include the salary range on their job postings? Lack of salary transparency contributes to racial and gender pay gaps and also wastes the time of job seekers. So in the state of California, where we are located, we are now required to do that as of, as of January 1st. And for the reasons that Renu 
um, illuminated. I totally agree, and I'm happy to do so. And I think that'll help job seekers better understand if they're a fit for us. Um, the cost of living is high in California, and it lets someone know if um, our salary allows them to have the standard of living that they expect. I think, you know, I, I can't answer the why, but if you are interviewing in a state that's not California, that doesn't have this transparency law, um, and you find, you, you know, that you come across a, an a opportunity that doesn't list the, the salary, I would say, you know, don't be afraid to, to ask for the range, um, because interviewing candidates takes a lot of resources on the institution's end, and we also don't want to be wasting um, our time um, or a candidate's time when, you know, the salary range is not a match. So don't be shy about asking for a range if it's not listed. And I just thought about it is I believe I Holly could answer this, um, but AALL publishes a salary survey. And I believe that in California, it goes down to Southern California and it goes down and it's so it has been in some years so specific to include L.A., uh, versus Orange County. So my thought also is that someone could um, can look at historical trends there um, through the AAWL salary survey. Is it every three years or every two, Holly? I think it's every two, and sometimes it, it sometimes it can't go as low because it depends right. on how many how many right. actual right. responses they get. But it's a great I mean it's a great resource, right? If you're if you're it's, if you don't have anything, if you have a lack of information, it's a really good place to get. Yeah, and when I was compare. When I was negotiating my own salary for this position, I used it. So I just encourage everyone to use that. Excellent. Okay. And then um, our next question in the queue was, if you want to pursue a JD, does it matter which law school you attend? I, I can jump in on law school choice. I mean, I think the the... The short answer is law school is such a personal decision. It's such a big investment of time and money and um, such a personal decision. I mean, some some people focus on the ranking of a law school and there's just been so much this year, especially um, discussed about the rankings. But I would say, you know, if you're going to invest in law school, your time, your effort, your money, make the right personal choice for you um, in terms of, you know, having a competitive advantage in a law librarianship um, application, you know, I, I don't see one law school having an advantage over another, um, you know, it, law school is what you make of it. And so find a place that is going to be something you can make the best of for, for you in your particular situation. There are so many factors that go into law school choice. I maintained a full-time job while I went to law school at night. So the only there are two choices for me in LA, Loyola and Southwestern. I applied to one law school and that was Loyola. I had no problem and that wasn't a consideration or wouldn't be a deterrent for being placed here at USC, which is a top 20 institution, even though my law degree is from a much lower ranked institution. Uh, that just, you know, for in my hiring of librarians, that's, that's not a big factor. There are many other factors I would... Um, I would consider before that. Okay, the next question is, what advice would the librarians with JDs give to a current law student working in a law library about resume building and networking? Oh, I thought you were gonna jump in, Diana. You were nodding your head. <laughs> I'll speak after you. Okay. Um, so, you know, so, so much of, you know, what was said in this roundtable today is directly applicable, I think, to that question. Um, but in addition, um, you know, I would say that it's also a very personal thing. You know, your resume is unlike any other resume. And so if you have, you know, again, mentors, have them look at your resume, see how, you know, the things that you have on it can be tailored um, to a career in, in law librarianship. Um, yeah, I don't know. Diana, what are your thoughts? <laughs> It's funny because I have one of our 1Ls coming and talking to me uh, next week about law librarianship. And, you know, she has spoken with me about becoming our research assistant this summer in the law library. So she wants to gain some experience. That's often something that happens um, 
you know, I think in getting to know librarians that often can also be an inspiration for a JD student becoming a librarian. I think just strong research skills um, wherever you end up uh, in your job experience. And, you know, if you can try and get some experience working in the law library as a research assistant or faculty member as a research assistant, I think that would help. Excellent. Yeah, and the chat's open too. I know that we have a few um, people in attendance who are working in different capacities in the law library. So if you want to weigh in the chat also, um, feel free to do so. Um, Let's see our next question here. We have chat or questions in the Q&A and in the chat, but I'll go in order of time. Um, what is a typical day week like for your position? I imagine the general job is reference librarianship for lawyers, but I could be wrong. Who are your users? What kind of questions do you typically get? And I'm trying to understand the day-to-day -day environment. I can uh, jump in here uh, quickly and tell you that uh, it, it depends and it varies quite a bit. In the fall semester, we were teaching, uh, all the reference librarians here, we're teaching legal research to uh, 1L students. So for the fall semester, the orientation was definitely on teaching, grading, preparing for the next week's class. Um, I also have been involved with doing a couple of workshops for USC undergraduates who are interested in legal writing. So those come up uh, once or twice a semester, um, but, the users are generally not uh, lawyers looking for reference help. It's more either students who are looking for reference help um, or research help, where we have students who are now uh, getting jobs working in law firms and have some questions about the best way to pursue a legal research issue. Um, here from nine to five, Monday to Friday, there's always a reference librarian assigned to reference. So you can people call um, students and faculty can come to the uh, reference counter, or we get emails from uh, USC undergrads, USC uh, law students, and from faculty members. Um, so the kind of experience varies with the time of year. Um, if you're working in a public law library, the questions you're going to get where you're going to need to assist somebody with legal research are more likely to be members of the public who are trying to figure out their own legal problem as opposed to lawyers coming in and asking for assistance uh, with a research issue. But we get some of those here with people calling in, but also in a public library, you're really gonna get a lot of members of the, pro the public who, for instance, are having questions about um, a landlord tenant issue. They've received an eviction notice and they want help with how they can respond to that. While you can't give out legal advice, what you wanna be able to do is point them in the direction of the resources that will help with their problems. And I mentioned earlier doing LibGuides. This is one of the areas where LibGuides can really help. Uh, in Vicki's uh, legal research class, I did a LibGuide on the rent controls for all the cities and throughout the county of Los Angeles. So you have those kind of, excuse me, resources available for members of the public where they can go to one source and hopefully find all the information they need to find about that topic. So I guess a, the long answer to a short question was, it varies day to day. I just wanna jump in quickly um, and just say, it also depends on your work, working environment, right? So I'm also in an academic law library, though my position isn't reference. I know the reference librarians at UCLA do not teach first year law students in legal research and writing. Um, that is not handled by the librarians. And so the day-to-day -day work for UCLA law librarian would be a little bit different maybe in the first semester than the day-to-day -day work at a USC um, law librarian. We do, a lot of drop-in sessions for law school classes. We do a lot of workshops. Um, we have a reference desk. We do some um, interesting sort of outreach to students in their spaces. We do these quick short lessons to try and engage with students. Um, and then we do a lot of faculty research um, and faculty services assistance. So when you're looking at um, particular types of academic law libraries, you may also want to dig into what do those librarians do because it may vary from place to place. Um, the other thing is uh, 
I think this is one of the fun aspects of the profession is that you don't necessarily, well, you all can correct me if your experience is different, but my experience is most two days don't look the same, right? And you're moving from thing to thing and you have opportunities for professional development and professional engagement. And it's very exciting. And so sometimes you have a little bit of latitude in determining what your day-to-day looks like, which is also an exciting aspect of the profession. And I can sort of jump in a little bit from the court and government side briefly. Um, So our library is not open to the public. Um, We just serve our judiciary and our our folks in our uh, building, but a lot of court libraries are serve both. They serve their judiciary and they're also their public law library. Um, So that's a very kind of interesting mix that, um, that comes up. The other thing I will say just about court research, again, this is, you know, speaking from our experience, but, um, you know, things come up in front of the, you know, a Supreme Court that are, you know, many years old and so collections are, you know, have a lot of superseded materials and um, a majority of the research we do is legislative history and, you know, intent and looking at that kind of thing. So, um, you know, a little bit of a different take than, you know, some of the things I used to focus on in the law firm that wasn't, you know, I did that, but that wasn't you know, the bread and butter. So um, just to share a little bit from the court and government side to give you a flavor of what happens, but I would agree no two days are the same and everything, you know, it's, it's always a really interesting challenge. Well, Pablo, did you want to say, since your perspective is a little bit different working in uh, for the law firm? I agree with Jocelyn in the chat. I work primarily with uh, legal professionals. So my library, like Holly's, is not open to the public. We don't even call it a library. We are research services within the larger knowledge management department within the global firm. So we have a desk that's fully staffed 24 hours a day because we have people in Belfast across the globe that also take these tickets. So I came from this position uh, being in a public library, being on the reference desk. So it's very much like a polar opposite type of work environment where working in the public library was very exciting, stressful, exciting. There were no two days were the same, lots of professional development opportunities, lots of engagement. Whereas I would say my work as a firm librarian now is very wrote 50% of it is a lot of business development. So we uh, are developing work products about companies where they're trying to bring those companies in as clients. And then I would say the other 50% is like hard and fast case law, legal research. And that can be really fun because you're like puzzling out what exactly the attorney needs, but also you send them a list of like 15 cases and it's on them to figure out exactly what they want. So I was able to come into that position without as much substantive legal background as some of my other colleagues who have JDs and are able to teach those substantive law classes, whereas I know enough to like to be dangerous, right? I'm like, oh, I can pick like, oh, here's a, something you're citing to. Let's see what other cases cite to this. And oh, here's another key keyword we can bring in. It's like speaking a different language across like 45 different databases. So I would say because of my position being remote, your tech skills are very, very important because you're having to draw from all these different places, putting it in like a nice little package for the attorney and wrapping it up and say, here you go. And then nine times out of 10, they're like, cool, and go on their merry way. But the 10th time they're like, this is not what I asked for. And they're like, oh, okay, well tell me what you need. And then you do follow-up research for them. And my department, is growing, expanding, and there is going to be more opportunity eventually to build out our page on the internet, to train, but those special projects are just not fully there yet. So I am anticipating that I'll be able to do some of the really cool special project D type things that I got to do in the public library setting, but it's my eighth month at the firm and that just hasn't been the case yet. So that's where it's a little bit different. All right. And then we have, what advice do you have for current library students interested in law librarianship that don't want to pursue a JD? Um, I can take a stab at that. Uh, 
Some of it depends, I think, on where you are in your program and what your interests are. So if you're very early on in the program and still have quite a ways to go, um, I'd maybe try and talk with some law libraries that are local to you um, and see what opportunities there might be. You may want to look at some job descriptions at many of the sites that kind of were mentioned and that's on the links list and see what job requirements are and see what might fit your personality. Traditionally, if you're looking in academic law librarianship, traditionally, the jobs have been in access services, that's what my job is, and then also technical services like acquisitions and cataloging often will not require a JD um, as a component for the application. But as Cheryl mentioned early on in this roundtable, that trend is changing. So if your passion is reference and research and you really want to work in academia, there's probably going to be a it for you and pursue the courses that are going to help you engage with that. If your passion is for reference and research and you love attorneys, then there's already a robust place where you can look for jobs um, in the firm environment. Um, I'm not quite sure. I don't know, Pablo, if anybody else can talk about um, the perspective of what's required in a public environment, but I think it's definitely doable. This is something that I explored a lot because I was not interested in going to law school, but librarianship is what I was made for. So um, there's definitely a place for you. So it's just a matter of finding the right fit uh, for you and your particular interests. I would say working on a public law library desk and in a firm is you are essentially a generalist. Now, my law firm specializes in labor and employment law, but we get questions across the gamut. Just the majority of them are in that particular area. So it is helpful to be able to draw from personal experience, draw from reference interactions, draw from your own ability to craft a search. If you're speaking in the law firm environment, which is basically what you're doing, you're taking a question and then translating it into a keyword search string. Now, hopefully with AI, that's going to continue to change and we can do more natural searching and training in that. Um, but I would say that's the difference there. And I didn't, I was able to draw from my paralegal classes. Um, I went to University of San Diego, California Extension for my paralegal classes it was really fast. I did it in like 12 weeks. And then just working in law firms as a legal assistant, as a paralegal, drawing from those experiences also really benefited me when I was applying for positions in the job market. What advice do you have for a current 3L who doesn't have any experience in a law library, straight to MLIS, or is it more advantageous to practice? I could just throw in there. I realized that my um, this is somewhat my background speaking here, but I think having practiced law for a few years is um, a fantastic experience to take into law librarianship, particularly if you are dealing with uh, teaching legal research. Um, I think understanding how the research is going to be used and what uh, your managing attorney is looking for when they give you a research assignment, et cetera, um, what the courts are looking for if you're doing litigation. So I do think having some uh, experience practicing law is helpful um, in the long run when you're gonna be uh, pursuing librarianship. But that's again, my background talking here. I think also if you're, whether you're in your third year or your first or your second year of law school, there are, um, the opportunities may vary depending on where you're going to school, but there are faculty research uh, um, assistant opportunities. So that's a great way. Um, you know, you're, you're getting your legal research experience in your law school courses, but working with a faculty member doing more in-depth projects for scholarship can be a great way to kind of um, uh, tip your toe in the water <laughs> to test the waters. Um, if, if research is your is your interest. And also just getting a feel for working within the library because you'll spend a lot of time with librarians on <laughs> doing your work. All right, 
And let's see here, we have some other questions in the chat. I just want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Let's see here. Um, do you have any advice for applying to out-of-state jobs you are passionate about? If you are a hiring manager, would you honestly consider an out-of-state candidate? I know you you typed an answer, Diane, but if you just if others want to um, weigh in so you can not miss the answer. I would just say definitely I would hire someone from out of state. I look at, you know, hiring a librarian as, you know, building the team here. And there are certain things I'm looking for to complement who I already have here and certain skills and job sets. So I would definitely, if I found that uh, with someone out of state, we would pay for moving expenses. The same is true at UCLA. We're looking for the best fit for our environment um, and, where the person is coming from doesn't often matter. But that being said, I would encourage you when you're applying or you're in the interview process, it's worth mentioning why you want to relocate, why you want to go someplace else. Um, and it's also worth letting the employer know that you've considered the move. Like one of the challenges that we have hiring in California is the cost of living here is so much higher than in other states around the country. And so if you are coming from outside of California to California, if you have some experience with what it's like to live here, if you have some experience with traffic, if you have some experience with that cost of living and can communicate that, that will actually go a long way to um, helping the employer know that you've like seriously considered some of the challenges and issues. Um, and that goes both ways, right? If you're leaving California and going someplace else, what's taking you there? Why do you want to go there? I agree with Sangeeta. This is really where your cover letter comes into play and you need to present yourself in the best light. And that includes explaining why you're moving into the area and having concrete reasons. This is also a great opportunity to work those networking skills and get in contact with the local association geographically. See if you can have an informational interview with someone who's connected to the organization just so that they can put a face with the name and they know you all of a sudden. So before you were an unknown entity, but if you can make that connection Connection, then you are a known entity and you're much more likely to make it to the top of the pile, even if there are more people who are geographically desirable than you. So I would say those are two ways to combat the problem. Okay, more question here. Um, I'm wondering if folks are willing to speak more about references for resume CV, since I tend to only think of bosses and professors, but panelists mentioned mentors. So yeah, I think oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I think references are extremely important to you. And my boss always had a rule, you know, that we needed to notify her before we were going to list her as a reference. And I still to this day think that that is extraordinarily important because I had a job search and I called the person's reference and the person was unwilling to give a reference about that person. So you need to make certain that the people you list are willing to speak for you. I think that's also part of marketing yourself. I would just say that. Um, so far as listing a mentor on a reference, uh, I have done a lot of professionally professional work on committees with people outside of my own library. And they have become mentors to me and they have held various different positions um, throughout the US, some not even in academia. And so I have done work for them in terms of leadership and uh, they've been, they've watched that throughout the year. So they've been able to, you know, throughout my time on their committee. Uh, so they have been able to give references about leadership, about my personal qualities, about the fact that I'm extremely diligent. I do what I say, I communicate well, I am a good steward and work well with others. And so those are the types of mentors I've included, those who I've worked for with projects. I just wanted to, to interject here for a second, and I think this also goes back to being an outstanding candidate for a job position is when I started sending out uh, resumes and cover letters to various uh, law libraries and law libraries, excuse me, libraries and law libraries, I made sure I had my references lined up. Um, most job postings were up front that you were going to need. I think it was generally three references. I contacted Professor Steiner since we'd had a relationship from working together in legal research, and she was my supervisor as a peer mentor. Um, I asked my 
current colleague, my supervisor at the firm that I was working at, he knew I was graduating, would be looking for a job, if he would serve as a reference for me. And I contacted another attorney that I'd worked with previously for a number of years and confirmed that he would also act as a reference for me. So I wanted to make sure that they were all aware that I was interviewing um, and that I would hopefully be looking to them for a reference if it got that far along where I was potentially going to get a job offer. So when you're out there and interviewing and looking for a job, get your references lined up beforehand because you don't want to be in a position where someone's interested in you and now you've got to scramble to find people who will give you a reference and to contact them and let them know. So it's definitely something that you want to get kind of lined up in advance if you can. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, again, to sort of think outside the the box, one of the people that I have used as a reference for many years, um, because again, as I've served as AAAO president, I used the person who was the executive director at the time for our association, because we worked together incredibly closely. And while, you know, different work than what I would do in a job speaks to leadership and other types of skills that would obviously come into play. So, um, but I agree, you know, you need to let people know, give them the job description, help them as much as you can to understand kind of how they can, you know, help you. Um, you know, and work together. But um, but that's something to think about, too. And I just want to add something quickly. Holly is completely on point. When I agree to serve as a reference for someone, I ask them for a CV. I ask them for a personal statement. There are unique things about students I've had in my in my class for six months that I may not know about until I receive the their personal statement. So it's really, really helpful to help your reference help you. Absolutely. I was going to add that as well, um, because it helps us write a more compelling um, recommendation for you to help you get that job. So uh, the more information you provide us, the better reference we can provide. So one other thing that I was going to comment about um, references is think about having a variety of people be your reference who can speak to different aspects of your skills or different experiences that you might bring. So most places are going to ask for probably three references, and you may want those three references to be different people for one job than another. Um, And then as far as listening your mentors, um, I think other people touched on this, but just to be really explicit, anybody who's your mentor, you have some connection with them, right? It may not be a direct report. Like some of my mentors are just other librarians that I work with, but that are bringing a unique perspective to the table. Um, A lot of them are people I've worked with committees on and whatever, but you always have a connection with that mentor. So anyone that you have that professional connection with is someone that can speak towards your skills. So I think that's what we mean when we're talking about having mentors as your references. Also, when Diana was talking about mentors, she was talking about these are people that are your advocates. They're your cheerleaders. They're the people that think you're fantastic. And that's who you want representing you when you're looking for a job. Any other questions? Thank you so much for the questions and our fantastic panelists. Um, I appreciate you all for for being here and sharing your wisdom. And I'll just leave one more second for any questions before we wrap up for the evening. And again, um, I will be sharing a recording link to this presentation. Um, It does take a while for us to process it, um, but Everybody who has registered will get a recording link and that handout link. So thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.